Good afternoon. How are you, Jennifer? Are you, I, I think we're in the same time zone ish. You're in Arizona, maybe? Yeah, for half the year, we're in the same time half zone. Half the year, right? There you yeah, go. Yeah, so I'm I'm on the California side of Arizona right now. So we are in the t same time zone. There's a California side. Okay. Oh, no, just that we flip. So half the year, um, we're with California. Half the year, we're, um, yeah, we're with. Okay. <laughs> we're through Mexico. You. And yeah, so, so we, yeah, I think that says a lot about us. Uh, the state of Arizona right now. Dang, it's like a microcosm, right? Yeah. Uh, well, welcome. It's a pleasure to talk to you. The The book is going to be the main thrust of our conversation. They call it online. They call it Galley Bragg. I got the, uh, the, uh, the ARC, right? Merchants of the Right, Gun Sellers, and the Crisis of American Democracy. Quite an accomplishment. And like I said, we'll talk about that in just a, a few minutes. But um, I'd love to know kind of where, where it all began as far as reading and writing um i mean there's a lot the book is so great because it's so objective but there's also some beautiful moments of you know connection between like you and your father and um you know his influence on you and all that but i just wonder about like was it a a house that valued reading were you in the library all the time were you like somebody who took a while to get into writing reading and writing kind of how did that work yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really, um, this is my third book and I really enjoyed writing this book in part because it was the first time that I I brought my my biography in um, with regard to my father who is, um, or um, he's passed away, but, um, you know, very, very conservative um, in, in all the <laughs> almost cliched ways. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, so, yeah, so he, he plays a, plays a part in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a very conservative household, um, but I definitely was in a household that um, valued education, valued mm -hmm. reading. Um, I, I think that that was actually something that was, um, and, and I write about this in the book that, you know, in fact, um, my father, who was, you know, so invested in, in Ronald Reagan, in, you know, many, many dimensions of, of conservative politics, um, in fact, his embrace of education was in some ways uh, what made it so that I would inevitably, uh, you know, <laughs> find myself questioning his beliefs and questioning his politics, right. um, and then eventually thinking through them um, from a sociological perspective. And so absolutely, um, education, reading, um, foreign language, um, all of these things were actually um, quite, um, yeah, quite part and parcel of, of, yeah, growing up in my in my house. Huh. I remember hearing fairly, I don't know, a couple years ago, but like, you know, the idea of like the evangelical Christian um, was saying, you know, like she was saying, you know, when I was growing up, I think around the same age as us, maybe it's like when I was growing up, you said a bad word and you got your mouth washed out with soap. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of like comparing it to now. You know, I mean, Trump is profane and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think you mentioned maybe Catholicism. I wonder how much maybe Catholicism like informed that that conservatism from your dad or, or were they kind of were they separate or were they part and parcel? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Catholicism is so interesting because I grew up, you know, you grow up and you think that your home is the world and you sure. think that these are how these things fit together. And um, yeah, I didn't know that everybody didn't grow up with conservative parents because I was like, oh, they're your parents. They must be conservative. <laughs> that's the way it is. Sure. Um, I was like older than I think I should have been when I realized that um, Catholicism was actually not, you know, uh, like as mainstream a religion as Protestantism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I definitely think that there was, um, yeah, I definitely think there were elements of Catholicism that definitely, um, you know, impacted my dad's style in terms of, um, you know, respecting authority and respecting, um, you know, tradition for the sake of tradition, um, mm -hmm. definitely his politics surrounding um, reproductive justice were informed by his Catholic faith. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I definitely think that there was um, elements of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in some ways it, it's interesting because you, you look back and you, you wonder. And so, as I mentioned, my dad has, has passed away. And so, you know, I can't ask him how all these things fit together. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is not being able to have those conversations. But one of the things that, um, you know, I try to talk about in the book, and I, I use my dad as an example of this, is that it's so easy to, look at our political debates and imagine maybe even engage our political opponents and really like paint them into very two-dimensional types right um and i think that that's something that um you know i i 
growing up, I think it was maybe from a child's perspective, maybe somewhat easy to do that. But as I, as I got older and sort of saw my father in, you know, many different dimensions, as well as see him um, move through um, uh, his, the terminal illness that, that killed him, which was ALS, um, you know, it was impossible to not see him as sort of the quintessential conservative, but also to not see how that was actually complicated by mm. many aspects of the way that he lived his life. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting to play this game of like how all the puzzle pieces fit together, but I also think that it's an equally powerful exercise to recognize that we are all more complicated than the puzzle pieces that make us up. Mm -hmm. Well, my condolences on the loss of your father for sure. I ALS is a horrible disease, right? Oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, what were you reading in adolescence into college? What, you know, what were the, the book series or, or writers or type or genres that you were really into? Yeah, um, that's interesting. So I, I um, went to high school in Indiana, and I should give a shout out to the Indiana Academy. So this was okay. this really... Um, yeah, this really special place. It was a publicly funded boarding school. So certain states have these, um, they're almost like magnet schools. Um, and they tend to be in states that aren't really renowned for their public education systems, I could say. Um, and so there are these brilliant, um, you know, it's it's these brilliant spaces where they're, um, at least when I went to this school, and I it may have changed, there might be like a not more of a nominal fee now. Um, but other than, you know, books, and, and I, I think there was just like very, very minimal costs. Um, it was basically free to attend. So I would um, basically, okay. I moved there in my senior and junior year of high school. And it was like experiencing college, but as a high school mm. student. So super amazing, um, you know, living on my own. <laughs> thinking that I was living on my own, even though there were plenty of rules. And um, that space very much, um, I, I feel like so absolutely um, privileged and blessed to be able to have been a part of that environment, because that is where, yeah, I read, you know, the classics where I read, um, you know, I was reading political theory, I was mm. reading, um, you know, JD Salinger, that's uh -huh. you know, the, the ultimate for angsty, <laughs> angsty yes, in yes, the yes, 90s. Um, I, I will admit that um, I picked up some Karl Marx. Um, yeah. And that was actually uh, not because I, I was understanding it as a teenager. Mm -hmm. But um, I think at some point, I figured out that like, that would really be like a great form of teenage rebellion is to read yeah. Karl Marx in front of my father. <laughs> so it was one of those things where like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, just Dang. just an interesting moment. And, in, uh, you know, politics and family dynamics. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was kind of the, um, yeah, the immersive experience that I had as a, as oh, a high wow. Very yeah. cool. Um, what's the, the title is what, like waiting, reading Lolita in Tehran or something. It's like mm -hmm. reading Marx in front of my dad or something. In Indiana. Yeah. That could, that could be like your mem <laughs> part of your memoir or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did, did you start calling people phonies all the time after reading Salinger? Uh, yeah, we had, a, we, I, I had a couple of best friends that we, we, yeah, we kind of had our own. Yeah. You know, more, more or less. Yeah. Classic, yeah. That's a classic, uh, one for teenagers for sure. Um, so my correct, was it graduate school or undergrad when you went to Cal Berkeley? I went to UC Berkeley for graduate school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is UC Biz Berkeley as they call it, right? Um, yes. That, yeah. Actually, when I got accepted, I was so excited and I, you know, called my family because Berkeley was really my, my dream school. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I, I went there as a high schooler and was like, this is amazing. This is where I want to be. Um, and that was at a time where if you were not um, in state, it was basically impossible to get in. I know that's mm. changed a lot. Um, but for undergrad, that was the case then. And so I was like, okay, we got to prepare for, <laughs> for grad school for Berkeley. And so that was the dream. And and I got in and I called my dad and he, uh, you know, was very clear in correcting my pronunciation that it was in fact uh, UC Berkeley. So <laughs> <laughs> well, in my classroom here, let me see if you can, if I can show you the. Oh, amazing. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, is maybe I'm mixing this up, but I've heard that it's like more of the. I've heard people say that the city, that the city of Berkeley is maybe more liberal, more classically liberal than the college. Yeah. In in terms of like the 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 university is like, is, like the university is maybe is maybe more like business and maybe more kind of like button up than but when when the, like 
the berserkly part is maybe more of like the, the city than it is the college. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like, um, you know, I always laughed when I was doing my research. So my, my, my first book is based on my dissertation and it's on gun carriers and gun instructors, open mm -hmm. carriers, concealed carriers in Metro Detroit. And so I would go back and forth between, um, you know, Michigan and, and California mm -hmm. and several of the people that I was, you know, that I was studying and, and interviewing, um, you know, they would have something to say about Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And it was always funny because they'd be like the liberal epicenter. And it's like, right. oh, you don't understand. Like Berkeley is so left that they don't like liberals either. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's funny. So it's like, you don't realize you actually might agree on that. But, um, right. but yeah, I mean, I do think that there's, you know, Berkeley is a really, the, the university is a huge institution. And so I think depending on where you're sitting, yeah. um, is it the law school, is it the business school, is it the sociology department? Yeah. Um, it's going to be a little different. Um, yeah. And, and are you talking about, you know, the undergrad mobilization? Um, yeah. You know, there were strikes while I was there and that was graduate students and undergrads. They were, um, you know, definitely, um, yeah, they were, they were definitely engaged politically in a really different way than, you know, faculty in other parts of the university might've been. So yeah, yeah it definitely is a, is a, is a, it's a giant machine, right? It's yeah. a giant organism. <laughs> yeah. Go, go a little bit South and you'll be at UC Santa Cruz. That's pretty, pretty left as well. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so citizen protectors you're talking about was 2010. Am I, I mean, you talked about like immersive, like, is that, is that gonzo journalism or not? Would that be? I mean, we, we call it ethnography, qualitative okay. methods and sociology. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that's, it's an interesting question to ask, like where the line between excellent journalism and, um, and sociology, like where yeah. you draw the line. I mean, sociologists are, you know, we want to be systematic. We want to you know, collect data. a great deal mm -hmm. of data. We want to apply an analytical lens. Um, we usually want to do things that are um, lengthier than, you know, arcs of arguments that that unfold over the course of books rather than right. you know, a series of, of articles. But I mean, in some ways, I think it's interesting. Some of the, you know, some of the best gun journalism is deeply sociological. So mm -hmm. yeah, there is a, there is an interesting tension between the, the two forms. Yeah, I forget who I was talking to you recently, but he was a big fan of Hunter, as a kid Hunter S. Thompson, and we were saying, you know, don't don't follow his uh, his diet though. Don't follow his diet yeah. of alcohol and you know rum and gin and all yeah. that. But maybe the yeah. journalism was good. So who who were you who were you reading? Kind of backing up a little bit, if if Gonda, if you know journalism sociological writing is is your jam, so to speak. Like who were you inspired by in in those genres? Uh, in terms of. Um... Sorry, in terms of journalists or in terms of sociologists or just across the board? I, I guess both. I guess like, I mean, what kind of shaped your your type of writing? Because um, I mean, you could, I mean, it's definitely sociological. I mean, there are, um, there are strains of, you know, I mean, I mean, journalism, of course, but who, who did you read that made you say like, I want to do that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think as a graduate student, I was really motivated by ideas. And so motivated by, you know, these, these, theoretical frameworks that were going to help me make sense of the world around me. So, you know, Jonathan Simon's Governing Through Crime is, mm -hmm. is a huge book that really influenced um, how I think about, um, you know, guns and, and the appeal of guns in American society. And so, you know, in some ways, I think as a graduate student, I wasn't thinking about writing as a craft. I was thinking about how do I make this, how do I, how do I put an analysis together? Yeah. And I think that the writing part actually, um, you know, it came after when I, I realized like, you know, you've got to actually have people <laughs> Like they have to actually be able to not just read it and understand it, but like want to read it, want to turn the page. Um, and so that's been, um, yeah, I mean, actually in some ways, so I do, um, you know, I do academic writing. So like peer reviewed articles that very few people read. I do books. Um, I also do op-ed writing and writing for popular audiences. And so it's very interesting to think about like how you translate something that, you know, sociologists might consider their very sophisticated ideas into, you know, something that, um, you know, someone who's picking up a newspaper or flipping on, you know, a website can can find intelligible and and, and worth reading. Um, and so I guess I actually feel that in some ways, the training that I took um, with the Women's Op-Ed Project, so this is an organization that is aimed at increasing um, representation of um, people who are underrepresented in um, op-ed writing. So, you know, just breaking down, like, this is this is how you do this kind of work. Um, you know, the, the good grace 
cases of op-ed editors at newspapers that basically were like, you have an idea, you're a baby grad student, I'm going to kind of show you how you actually craft this into an op-ed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've been really lucky with the generosity of, of people who have um, wanted to kind of extend that branch to, to help me sort of, you know, think through how to, how to make prose intelligible. So yeah, it's one of those things that once you get to grad school, you're kind of so focused on your data, you're so focused on your theory that you're not, um, unless there's some like element within your training that, um, you know, when I say that, like, like literally like a course at your university or your program that is inviting you to think about what it means to actually communicate your ideas outside of academia. Unfortunately, it's, it's kind of a, um, yeah, it's it's kind of a very self-directed process, mm -hmm. which I think is problematic because sociologists, you know, just speaking as a sociologist, not even as a gun scholar, you know, we have a whole lot to contribute to making sense of the world around us. But um, sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we're not able to uh, put that in a language that's accessible to, yeah. to people. You, uh, maybe not literally thinking of, you, you know, the term lexile, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Like. I, like with like with like George Bush and Trump, like, you know, you read about like the average presidential speech is at like a fourth grade level. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly right, but it's really low. Right. Mm -hmm. do, do you think of that? Like maybe not literally thinking of like what Lexa I'm writing for, for like a popular audience. But do you think of do you think of that? How do you think of that as you write for fellow academics slash for like the the mainstream you know public? Yeah, yeah. I guess the way I think about it not is not so much in terms of like a fourth grade or an eighth grade level or anything like that. Um, I think of it as how much work am I asking my reader to do and is it uh, fair to them? You know, thinking about like the amount of overload we have in terms of information and also the absolute gift that you have given me as a result of re spending your precious time reading my book. I mean, we, we don't have infinite time on this planet. We have very limited time. And so if someone is willing, you know, now, of course, some of this is assigned coursework. So <laughs> So mm -hmm. how yeah. much of this is a choice versus coercive is another thing. But, you know, if someone is um, giving me the gift of their time, I want to make that worthwhile to them. And that's not to say that everything is going to be, you know, some some concepts are just hard. Like sometimes it's it's hard to explain things and that's OK. But I, I think of it more in terms of I've been entrusted with something. And so I want to make good on the reader's trust in me with regard to with regard to my writing. And I don't want to make it unnecessarily complicated. Um, I want to make it interesting. I want to make it worth worth their while. Great transition into the book. It's not unnecessarily complicated. It's complex. It's not, you know, it's not, I don't know how to say the word. I've never said it out loud. Facile, F-A-C-I-L-E. Yeah. Okay. Right? It's not, it's not facile like that, um, you know, because there's, it's a really, there are really important ideas and issues going on in the book. We are recording this about a month before, but just tell me a little bit about like, you know, so it's coming out May 2nd. Those who are listening, it's going to be May 2nd or May 3rd. Um, how does it feel to, I know you've had books published before, but how does it feel to have this one out in the world and these, these weeks leading up to it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a book that, writing this book was an absolutely different process than any you know, this is book number three and so fundamentally different than the other two books. Mm. I think every book is its own, like they're like children. They're, they're their own little entities and they come out in their own way. So they, yeah. they develop. Um, but this one was definitely uh, very, very unique in that I had no idea I was going to write it or had any semblance of doing the research for it until basically I decided that it was what was what had to have happen. I like the rest of the world literally um was, you know, sitting at home in March 2020 and thinking, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. um, and this question was not just like, what am I going to do in terms of research? I, I, I was concerned about that because I had on deck a project that absolutely depended on traveling and doing all the things that it became very clear were not going to happen in the near future. Mm -hmm. But I was also concerned about what was going to happen to my students, to my graduate students, to, um, you know, higher ed. And so I wanted to 
figure out, you know, how do I, can I develop some, basically some research question out of this present moment, um, you know, to give graduate students opportunities to research and to, um, you know, so that we're not just sitting and, and kind of afraid of what's, what's happening next. Um, and so, in some way, and, and that was absolutely, I should say, like from the onset, um, Kat Burgess, Madison Armstrong, Elliot Treslow, Minyoung Ahn, um, these are all grad students who helped immensely and assisted in a wide variety of the aspects of making this book possible. Mm -hmm. um, and also the National Science Foundation um, funded, um, uh, provided funding for the, for the project. And so, um, yeah, so basically I'm sitting there and then I start hearing the stories of people rushing to gun stores to purchase guns amid a pandemic, which, you know, is in some ways exactly what you would expect in the United States, right. but is also, um, yeah, is also not what you would expect when you are thinking about the um, ways to respond to a pandemic, to, to respond to a microscopic virus. So I basically said, okay, this is, you know, what my training has prepared me to do. I'm going to start calling and interviewing gun sellers and and just talk to them about how they're navigating what's going on how they're you know what what sense they make of these surges how they're experiencing the surges are the surges across the board as big as every you know all the headlines are saying who's buying guns is this different what does this mean for gun politics what do they think is going to happen um and so you know it really was sort of one day everything was you know and this is again many of our experiences um one day it was life as usual and the next day, okay, I guess I'm doing this new project. And so, yeah, this book was conceived, executed, and written um, in pandemic times. And that has also been a very different experience because, you know, scholars, and this is another difference between, I think, journalists and scholars, you know, journalists are very concerned with, like, the timeliness. They want to be, you know, directly engaged with, you know, not just the issue of the year, but the issue of the minute. Sure. And sociologists academics, you know, we want to be relevant, but we also pride ourselves on being able to take a step back and say, you know, what's the, what's the big picture? What's the underlying thing that, you know, maybe if we're so focused on the nitty gritty minute to minute details, we're not going to see. And so writing this book, I had to constantly be like, okay, how do I push myself into the present, but also pull myself away? And of course, in the context of this, just kind of overwhelming, you know, like where everybody's catastrophizing and doom scrolling, that was um, particularly hard to do. And, um, and yeah, and I think, you know, in terms of like feeling, you know, how I feel about this coming out, you know, we're recording this at a moment where Trump has just been indicted and charged. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. And maybe by the time this is released, we, we do know much more of how that story is going to unfold. I definitely have felt, you know, month by month that, you know, it, it's kind of been so. So I finished the manuscript in um, last summer, in um, summer of 2022. And so just kind of watching the, the plates of American politics shift has been yeah, it's been a little nerve wracking. Like, what if I, you know, what if, what if things are going to shift enough that, you know, like, like mm -hmm. how, how is the book going to speak to those shifts, given that there are definitely going to be things and there have been things that have happened over the past year that um, are very um, major and relevant to, to what the book is about. So that's mm -hmm. been a little like edge of my seat sort of. <laughs> Yeah. sort of uncertainty but you know that's that's the the problem with the publishing world right or not the problem mm. with the publishing world but that's one of the the things you sign up for when you when you do book publishing is that you know that your book is going to you know it's not going to come out in the moment that you are writing mm. it and so you have to somehow negotiate that and yeah, just as like a side note, I mean, we saw that all through 2020 and into 2021, where, you know, books were making predictions about vaccines and how the mm -hmm. pandemic was going to end. And it was like, they were published and within a week, they were already outdated. Because, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was, um, I, yeah, it, 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 thankfully that was not the con, <laughs> that's not the context in which yeah, I'm publishing yeah, yeah. this, but it's still, we're still kind of in that world. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate the, that distinction you make between like the journalists and the sociologists, because it makes a lot of sense. Like it really is your book really is a time capsule of 2020, which is, you know, uh, March, 2020, you know, it was three, three years and, and one month ago, it wasn't that long ago, but like, it really is a, a, a time capsule of that very specific time when toilet paper was a thing. Right. <laughs> and all those, those type of, um, you know, we've, they've had so many different stages of the, of the pandemic. 
and it just fits it, it just fits so well and it, it it does give us that perspective i know it's, it's hard to make perspective when it's only been three years or two years for a lot of the events yeah. but it just it fits and like i haven't really read a lot um but i know there's like a lot like a lot of fiction out there or a decent amount of fiction and stuff that are trying to like trying to sum up the the early pandemic and your book definitely succeeds because like you said it was just a a time that even now we're kind of like whoa did that really happen yeah. 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 Even when I was writing it. So, you know, 2020 happens, 2021, I'm, I'm really focused on writing. And, you know, even at that point, I'm like, you know, in a couple of years when this comes out, are we going to just all want to forget about it and pretend it never happened? So nobody's going to want to read the book. Um, I don't think so, but I, I actually don't think we're there yet. Uh, but yeah, it does feel it, it. Sometimes I have to remind myself, like we really did go through that, yeah. like really sat home for months on end yeah, and, yeah. It, it's yeah it's kind of mind-blowing um how distant that feels i had like a like a spray you know you use for like your hair or whatever you put water in it i would mm -hmm. spray i put some weird mixture i put some mixture of soap and water and i'd spray the doorknob because i just touched it because i just touched the grocery remember that remember that oh yeah <laughs> yeah i mean people were like pouring bleach on themselves yeah. like nobody nobody knew nobody nobody knew, nobody knew. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. and um and yeah and i think that's what i really um what was really interesting when i was interviewing gun sellers is that you know as the months went on you know they, they there was mo more coherence and part of that was you know, there, the, the threats that were out there mm -hmm. kind of became more familiar, um, yeah. you know, in terms of um, just everything that unfolded during 2020. But, mm -hmm. you know, that initial moment, it, it really was clear that, I mean, even though very quickly we became very politically divided, there was a lot of, I mean, we just didn't know what to make of it or what side we were on or how to, mm -hmm. you know, how to make heads or tails of any of it. And that was, I think, you know, in terms of the interviews, I feel like there was this, um, yeah, there were these really powerful moments where, you know, I'd be interviewing, I'd say, you know, tell me about this, tell me about that. And then sort of the interview would be done. And I think, okay, I'm about to, you know, I did them, did them remotely. Okay. I'm about to, you know, hang up and, you know, then they'd flip the script and say, well, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? And it wasn't a like, you're a sociologist, tell me right. what's happening. It was, hey, we're all in this together. And literally yeah. anybody's guess is good, is as good as anybody else's, right? And so that was, that was an interesting moment that very quickly um, evaporated, I think, in terms of the the deep partisanship that unfolded then into, into 2020. So obviously it's pretty, it's pretty obvious from the title that it, you know, it, it focuses on the gun sellers themselves, gun store owners, gun, gun, you know, people that work at the gun stores. Um, you interviewed 50, is that right? Yeah. 53. And um, with each, with, with most, if not all, you mentioned, you'll, you'll say, you know, so-and-so from Arizona, you know, white or biracial, the great, great, great majority are white. And mm -hmm. I just wonder about what you learned or what was reinforced for you about the like the politics of of race mm -hmm. and, and racism in the like the type of person that would be a gun store owner, I guess. Yeah, this is such a huge question. And it's a question like that's applicable to gun sellers themselves, but also just gun culture overall yeah. Yeah. um i think there's yeah there's there's so like we could spend we could just do a whole podcast series know, on this question right? because I it's know. so complicated mm -hmm. and one of the things you know if we look at who gun owners are and you know definitely my sample of gun sellers they tended to be white conservative men right um that's kind of the the stereotype um and it is like the demographic profile of of gun owners and gun and gun sellers uh, you know obviously in my book and that being said, though, you know, one of the things that was really fascinating about 2020 is that you have all these, quote unquote, like atypical or non-traditional, whatever we want to call it, um, gun owners, gun buyers, you know, and these include first time gun buyers. These include racialized minorities, sexualized minorities, women. Um, it includes liberals even like that's, you know, that that's one of the dynamics. And I think that, you know, and this this is actually also something that I found in citizen protectors when I did the research with gun carriers and and gun instructors, you know I, I there is the way that race plays out is 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 complicated. So you know there is a very much um, I would say and and that's not to say that there are, and and there's 
you know, there's race in terms of explicit what people are talking about. There's race in terms of, you know, subconscious structures in the brain, implicit bias. Um, so this is really like when I talk to people, what people are saying. Um, but, you know, there is a, you know, and, and it really came out with, with the gun sellers I talked to, um, this embrace of guns as sort of this great equalizer across mm -hmm. different demographic groups. So, you know, you have, um, and, and this is a saying, right? This is a saying, uh, God made, and, and it changes depending on like, <laughs> you know, the context, but more or less it's, um, and this is within the, this is like a saying within the gun world, um, you know, Sam, Samuel Colt, the, you know, mm. famed revolver manufacturer, um, or sorry, it, God created man and woman, but Samuel Colt made them equal, right? So the gun is this great equalizer. And, um, you know, so, so when I talked to gun sellers about the people coming into their stores, it was, you know, not just that like, oh yeah, all of these people who would not, you know, very like a totally new kind of clientele and, you know, it varied by gun store who they kind of highlighted as like the unusual, you know, the, the unusual gun buyers that were now coming in in droves. But, you know, they, they span demographic, demographic um, categories. And very much there was this sense of like, see, this shows that guns are this powerful tool for freedom, for safety, for security, for protection, for, for individual sovereignty. And, you know, I think that definitely some, some gun sellers, I mean, some gun sellers were more sort of overt about this than others, but, you know, there was kind of this glee of like, you know, this is a vindication of gun rights. And so, you know, it definitely wasn't the case that, um, at least in terms of what gun sellers were telling me, that they were, you know, trying to, um, yeah, that there was some barrier they were erecting with regard to, you know, who should be having guns, although there's one one exception to that, which I'll get to in a second. Mm. Um, but that being said, you know, the whole sort of politics of guns was very wrapped up in, you know, what kinds of freedoms and what kinds of protests are, you um, you know, the, the right kind of protest. And so, you know, I have one gun seller that I talked to who was like, you know, I have tons of people from all demographic categories coming into my store. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, and basically he's like, yeah, you know, I have a lot of African-American gun buyers coming in and they don't agree with Black Lives Matter. They don't agree with gun, you know, defund the police. Um, you know, they 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 want self protection. They want to own guns, and they don't agree with everything happening out there. And you know, I think that's like an interesting maneuver because it's a way to say, like, look, we embrace diversity in the gun store, but you know, there's certain kinds of politics are not, yeah. you know, are not acceptable, right? Or are not um, the kinds of politics that we want to associate with guns. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where you get the racial politics. So I talk about it in terms of a racial politics of respectability, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, you know, the respectable politics of, of, you know, individual rights and gun ownership, rather than the collective politics of, um, you know, mass protests and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, it, it comes out in these subtle ways. Um, and I think that it really comes out in terms of how also um, sort of this, and this is something that I try to get at in the book, is how democracy becomes an, a language for exclusion. And so how democracy sort of allegiance to, you know, the constitution. And and I, I know there's like a lot of people have their own ideas on like what democracy is and, you know, and I define that in the book and how I'm going to use it. So yeah, if you're, if you're watching this and you're like, that's not my definition. I know mm -hmm. I talk about mm -hmm. this in the book, mm -hmm. but you know, um, gun seller, you know, there, there were definitely, and I, I, I talk about sort of the libertarian mindset, the, right. um, eclectic mindset and then the illiberal, illiberal. Mindset. Uh -huh. yeah and there's definitely um you know there's definitely an articulation of democracy and constitutional rights and sort of what America is all about that is articulated in such a way that it explicitly um, writes out Obama, writes out, you know, Democrats, mm -hmm. writes out um, the kinds of collective protests and the kinds of collective political expression that are historically and present day associated with demands from marginalized peoples, whether that's racialized, sexualized minorities or what have you. And so, you know, there's definitely these deep ways in which um, race is shaping what's going on. Um, and it's actually happening through how people are talking about democracy, which is kind of one of the big points I'm trying to make in the book is that, you know, it's not, I think we came out, especially after January 6, we we came out, um, and I'm using we, that's always <laughs> like, mm -hmm. who's the we? I think many of us came out, you know, sort of with this idea of, um, 
you know, there's a pro-democracy and anti-democracy contingent within U.S. politics, and, and that's what the battle is all about. But if you actually look at how both sides, however you divide those both sides up, both sides really believe and 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 are, are using the language of democracy to sort of make their claims. And so the question really comes down to, you know, who's included? Um, what kinds of political expressions are valued? Um, how do we think about our, our fellow citizens? Do we consider them worthy by virtue of the fact that they're our fellow citizens? Or is there sort of a price of the ticket to, you know, entrance into full engagement, engagement in American politics? And so, mm. uh, you know, that's that's kind of the like where a lot of the book goes in, in terms of race. Um, but yeah, so what I will say, though, too, is that um, there was the major, and this also kind of goes into the question of democracy, one of the major ways, one of the major